Thank you for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabolsi. Coming up, a raise for minimum wage workers. We'll hear from those who stand to benefit and businesses that are trying to balance the added costs. The Ocean Beach Pier has taken a beating. See the damage done by huge waves as the city evaluates what to do with the aging structure. And the San Diego Zoo put on a show at this year's Rose Parade. Get the story behind the float that was crowned best of show. We start with a different side of immigration. Those who come to the U.S. to advance their education include some postdoctoral students in San Diego who might soon be forced to leave the country. Education reporter M.G. Perez met with those who are caught in the middle and worried their families will be separated. I'm going to leave my dream and I work for that. Yu Gao and Suresh Madeshwaran are just weeks away from being forced out of the U.S. with the real possibility of leaving family behind. It just feels very challenging to live separately from my husband. Um, and we love each other so much. So I have a 30 month, 30 days grace period. Within this 30 days, I have to leave this country. After having a newborn baby, without a passport, without SSN, the stink of my mindset. Yeah, how am I going to take my baby back? Am I going to be separated? Gao is on a student visa from China. Madesh Warren has a J-1 exchange visitor visa. Both are allowed to remain in the country as long as they are employed in their postdoctoral jobs in academic research at UC San Diego. Both said they have been terminated, though as members of the UAW Academic Workers Union, they believe their contracts require at least a two-year assignment. Gao's only been a researcher at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography a year. She was told there's no more funding for her position, something she says is not true. I was informed there are uh, still four to five months of funding left, but my supervisor refused to use it to renew my contract or to um, give me a temporary position so I can have some time or a grace period to find my next position. Her husband is also on a student visa, finishing up a Ph.D. program next summer. She will have to return to China if she doesn't get her job back while he remains. But they both will have to leave student housing by the end of the month. Madeshwaran has a two-month-old baby girl with his wife. The couple would have to return to their home in India, but the infant is an American citizen without a passport or travel visa. He was told he was out of a job while on paternity leave. There is no transparency between uh, me and my boss or with the university. First thing, transparency is not there. The university's administration has the ultimate authority over the fate of academic workers. But postdoctoral scholars are under the direct supervision of their principal investigator, known as PIs. What they say goes, and the university follows, with few exceptions. <laughs> There are at least three other international postdoc scholars facing deportation, too. In December, union members protested outside the UC San Diego Moores Cancer Center, where Madesh Warren is a cancer researcher and a three-time cancer survivor himself. It's our view that the university really doesn't want us to implement this contract that they signed. And so... Our position is that we are going to continue to fight and, and make sure that every worker gets their rights that they deserve. We reached out to UC San Diego administration for comment on the terminations. A spokesperson said they would get back to us today. They did not, leaving these international scholars and their families wondering what the new year will bring. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. A change is coming to the way the military handles allegations of major crimes. Military commanders used to decide whether to move forward. Now, those cases will be reviewed by a newly established special counsel's office. KPBS military reporter Andrew Dyer says allegations of mismanagement led to the change. Decisions about whether to press charges against service members for 14 different major felonies will now be up to specially trained independent military prosecutors instead of unit commanders, a change years in the making and written into law by Congress in 2021. On Thursday, each military branch opened their own offices of special trial counsel staffed with trained military prosecutors and both military and civilian support staff. 
Critics say commanders had too little legal training and, in some cases, too much bias to make fair charging decisions. Perceptions, they say, could have prevented victims from coming forward. Don King spent three decades in the Navy as an attorney and judge and at one time was the legal advisor to the Navy Region's Southwest Admiral in San Diego. He says while he supports the change, it's not because he thinks commanders were interfering on behalf of accused service members. I never experienced a commander who made a decision to protect somebody who'd been accused and likely committed one of these terrible crimes. Not everyone shares that experience. In 2021, veteran women and victims advocates testified in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee about the challenges of getting justice when reporting sexual assault. That testimony in part led to this change. In a statement Thursday, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the change aims to strengthen accountability and increase the trust service members have in the system. One of the Navy's two primary special counsel offices is in San Diego, and the Marines have established offices in their fleet concentration areas, like Camp Pendleton. Pentagon data show that since 2010, as rates of sexual assault reports increased, the number of cases sent to trial decreased. King is now in private practice in San Diego, representing service members charged with various crimes, including sexual assault. He says too often commanders without legal expertise send unwinnable cases to court-martial, and the change should fix that. I would bet on it that you're going to find that, that prosecutions are going to drop not just a little, but significantly, uh, and convictions are going to go up. The new special counsel offices will also independently handle other felonies, ranging from stalking, domestic violence and revenge porn, to manslaughter and murder. Andrew Dyer, KPBS News. No matter where you work in San Diego County, if you make minimum wage, you got a raise at the start of the year. KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer looks at the impact on workers and business owners, with an even larger raise for fast food workers on the horizon. As of January 1st, the hourly minimum wage rose to $16.85 in the city of San Diego and to $16 in the rest of San Diego County and California. It's a modest raise compared to last year's. In both cases, wages are up roughly 50 cents. But Jerry's Street Churros co-owner, Tom Ta, says any raise affects business. He's looking into robot arms to make boba drinks and fewer employee hours. It's definitely a, a big impact and we require to restructure, uh, retrain. On April 1st, a far more impactful wage hike will take place, boosting the hourly pay of California's fast food workers to $20 an hour. For Oceanside resident Lucia Juarez, it's great news. She currently works for the minimum wage in the flower industry. Yo pienso que está muy bien. A mí me gustaría cambiar de trabajo porque 20 dólares la hora pues ya es yes, bastante dinero y porque siempre tenemos gastos que pagar. La renta principalmente es bien cara y principalmente la comida ahorita está muy caro. Dean of the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy, Carolyn Freund, says the upcoming fast food raises could have ripple effects on other industries and consumer prices. It's, it's not clear that it makes sense to do a minimum wage by industry, especially for fast food, where you could end up pulling people out of more necessary industries like healthcare or agriculture or sanitary services. Cosmos burger owner Erin Unur is planning for those ripple effects already. He says small businesses like his own will feel the pinch as he plans to raise wages and stay competitive. You know, it's a lot of franchising like a McDonald's in and out. They can afford to pay $20, but not like the small business us. I mean, if they can do the same job over there in $20, who am going to pay the $16, $18 to make a burger? The April 1st wage hike applies to all fast food chains with 60 or more locations nationwide. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. The minimum wage is just one of many new laws that took effect on January 1st. The latest KPBS roundtable dives into some of the others. You can listen at kpbs.org and wherever you get your podcasts. To make money, you need customers, but that's been hard to come by lately for those who rely on people crossing the border at San Ysidro. Gustavo Solis tells us about the reopening of a border crossing that businesses say is crucial to their success. Excellent news, obviously, to start on the right track this year. Genia Samaripa is vice president of international business affairs at the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce. 
Part of her job is to help businesses navigate the U.S.-Mexico border. So she is extremely aware of the impact of long border wait times and temporary closures. They cost businesses billions of dollars every year. As much as we want to say that our strategic location is key to our global competitiveness, that whole uh, speech relies on the fish and border infrastructure. Being close to Tijuana and its massive manufacturing sector gives San Diego a major economic advantage. But that advantage is squandered when long border wait times turn a 20-minute car ride into a four-hour commute. We remain working to get where we want to be, which is all crosses operating at full potential, lanes fully staffed, so that we may leverage our, borders, our border infrastructure's full potential. Samaripa says this impacts everything from trucks delivering goods to employees trying to get to work on time. San Isidro's Ped West border crossing was just one of four that Customs and Border Protection closed in December. Two others were in Arizona and one was in Texas. The agency says these closures were necessary to deal with an influx of illegal migration. In a statement, CBP says it will continue to prioritize border security. Ped West will reopen, but only for limited hours. People will be allowed to cross north into San Diego between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. And people will be allowed to cross south into Tijuana between 3 and 11 p.m. San Diego's business community is happy about this partial reopening. But they want more. They want border traffic to be back in full swing, which means having the right infrastructure to support it. Ped West has not been fully reopened since the pandemic. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. And here are some of the most read stories this week at kpbs.org. A local refugee has championed a San Diego urban farm for years. Now a nonprofit is threatening to evict her. A tax increase in LGBTQ plus youth protections are among California's new laws for 2024. And the San Diego Zoo float wins top prize at the Rose Parade. We'll have that story a little bit later. However, the biggest draw this week was at the beach. The OB Pier is closed indefinitely due to the huge waves that battered the coast last weekend. Melissa May went to Ocean Beach to see the damage. The Ocean Beach Pier has been closed since October due to public safety concerns. Then this weekend's waves knocked off railings and one of the pier's structural pilings. But as you can see, public safety has to be priority. And with the damage that we've seen over this last weekend, it's obvious that the right decision was made because uh, there was significant damage. The city has already been working to come up with solutions to potentially replace the pier and is engaging the public in the process. City of San Diego spokesperson Jose Isaya says the next meeting will be in April. Right now we're waiting for consultants to come back in a few months with the results from those uh, meetings and with that input on what the community recommends and what the consultants think we can do to to replace it and, and keep everybody happy. Matthew Martinez is one of the consultants the city is working with, but he also has a personal connection to the pier. He remembers when it opened in 1966. I did catch my first uh, fish. It was about a 10 inch uh, yellowfin croaker. And I was very proud of that. Uh, at the, if I remember right, I, I took it to bed and slept with it under my pillow. And my mother was not very happy about that. Now Martinez is a structural engineer with Moffat and Nickel, the firm brought on by the city to assess the pier. It's seen better days. We've done a lot of inspection, laboratory testing on the concrete, and have really made the determination that it's better to replace the pier as opposed to continually just putting Band-Aids on it that will maybe be good for a year or two. Martinez was in the process of posting a new sign about the Ocean Beach Pier Renewal Project and describes the pier's structural problems. When uh, reinforcing steel is embedded in concrete, a concrete is not a solid material, it's actually porous. And in this kind of environment, you get chloride ions, salt, from the seawater, and over time it makes its way into the interior of the concrete, uh, interacts with the reinforcing steel, and it begins to rust. Martinez says that rust causes the metal to swell and forces the concrete to break off. Both the superstructure and the substructure have gone through this really natural process of degradation in what is a very 
difficult marine environment. Wind, salt, water, things that are the enemies of reinforced concrete. For more information about the proposed renewal, go to www.obpeerrenewal.com. What people need to realize is these things don't last forever, and the process for replacement is something that doesn't happen overnight. The city says the pier will be closed through the rest of the storm season, and the earliest it could be open is late February. Melissa May, KPBS News. Now, from too much water to making sure San Diego has enough in the years to come, a new project under construction at the Miramar Reservoir will give the city's water supply a major boost. SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge shows us the biggest, most expensive capital project in the city's history. The pipeline you see floating in the water is one end of an eight-mile conduit that will connect the city's wastewater recycling plant to Miramar Reservoir in North San Diego. Later this week, this part of the pipeline will be under 100 feet of water. We are re getting ready to install an approximately one-mile branch pipeline that will be put, built uh, above water and will be sunk in place to allow us to distribute the purified water evenly uh, within the uh, Miramar Reservoir. Though the pipeline is being built above ground, Elif Chetin says the work on it will continue once it's underwater. We have divers. Um, in any given time, there will be five divers. Uh, majority of them will be installing, handling the coupling and uh, installing process, and there will be a pipe, uh, diver that is uh, doing the inspections for quality control. The cost of phase one of San Diego's pure water treatment project is about $1.5 billion. Phase one will be complete later this decade, and it'll produce 30 million additional gallons a day for the city. Richard Fernandez is a construction engineer who oversees the pipeline project. He says California regulations require recycled wastewater to go through a process called indirect potable reuse. That means treating the wastewater, then storing it in a reservoir and treating it again before it flows through your tap. So rather than doing a direct potable reuse, we're doing indirect potable reuse, which is just an added step for safety um, in case something does go wrong at any one of those steps there is some discontinuity between them so that you can address that you know, safely and um, be a little bit more conservative with the approach. The city of San Diego isn't the only place in the county that's recycling wastewater. In 2022, four East County water agencies broke ground on a water purification plant. It'll produce about a third of those agencies' daily water supply. Oceanside has already begun supplying residents with purified recycled water, 3 million gallons a day. San Diego's recycling plant will be by far the biggest and the most productive locally. Fernandez says the city needs its own locally controlled water source. Living here, it's kind of... The elephant in the room is there's really no water, right, locally available. So this project provides a way for San Diego to provide a safe, reliable, locally sourced drinking water, something that we really have never been able to do. San Diego's pure water treatment system will be operational and providing water to residents by 2026. They say it'll be at full capacity, providing nearly half the city's water needs by 2035. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. And all of our stories are available on the KPBS YouTube page. It's also where we live stream KPBS Evening Edition weeknights at 5. Subscribe and get notified when new content is posted. The San Diego International Auto Show wrapped up this week at the convention center. The mood was electric and so were a lot of the cars. Thomas Fudge stopped by to see how EVs are becoming a bigger part of this annual event. When you think of an American sports car, what do you think of? It's an American icon, right? Corvette, 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 almost 70 years, right? I, in fact, this is a little over 70 years of Corvette. So now we've added electric to it. So this is the E-Ray Corvette. The San Diego Convention Center is where you'll find lots of automakers showing off their latest electric models. Neuendijk says every brand at the auto show has an electric car, and people can choose among various kinds of electric. So you'd be, okay, here's a hybrid. Here's a plug-in hybrid. Here's a full electric. And they might all look the same, and that's why I say you have to kind of interview yourself 
and your family to see what do we want this car to be. Some of these cars are not available at the dealer yet. There are some prototypes. You can't buy a car at the auto show, but you can shop, of course. I asked Charlie Nelson what brought him to the auto show. A car brought me here. I rephrase the question. Why did he come to the auto show? My wife is in the market for a plug-in hybrid, and so uh, this is the place to go if you really want to see all of them in one place. And uh, my preference would be electric, but you know we're in a transition in our society to electric, and I'm okay with that. At the San Diego Auto Show, Toyota has its own space, Chevy has a space, and there's also a space devoted to electric cars called Electric Avenue. David Crow is one of the Electric Avenue experts. He says his engineering background made him devoted to electric cars. There's only a few moving parts in the entire drivetrain of an electric car, uh, such that there's a lot less things to go wrong. Uh, it's much more efficient. But not all of the people coming to the auto show are electric car converts. A lot of people are concerned about the cost of a vehicle and the range of a vehicle, how far it can go on one charge. As to range, Crow says... Most every car you see here has a range of at least 200 miles. And he says, yes, there are affordable electric cars like the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Bolt that sell in the high 20s and low 30,000s. One customer said his preference for electric cars is pretty simple. I don't like the idea of giving uh, money to uh, the industry that uh, promotes uh, global warming. The San Diego International Auto Show runs through the weekend and on the first of the year. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. The San Diego Wildlife Alliance brought home the top trophy for most beautiful float at the Rose Parade in Pasadena. MG Perez shows us more of this year's entry and how it's helping the zoo's mission to protect wildlife. It began with a roar 107 years ago when the San Diego Zoo first started protecting and preserving wild animals. The San Diego Wildlife Alliance entered this 55-foot float in the Rose Parade featuring flowered replicas of some of its current superstars, like Karen, the 32-year-old great ape that survived open-heart surgery, and Chinook, the orphaned polar bear. I really like this polar bear because it's fluffy and also I like polar bears. Eight-year-old Violet Anderson and her family met the real Chinook this morning at the San Diego Zoo. They came all the way from Chicago for the chance to be entertained and educated. I like how there are a ton of animals and you actually get to experience to be around animals that you probably wouldn't see even if you looked really hard. Polar bears and lions and orangutans live in habitats designed to engage visitors and to teach them how they can help save these animals. It's great to learn about all the conservation. We learn about um, different genetic techniques that are being used here um, at the um, safari park and at the zoo. The San Diego Zoo and the Wild Animal Park provide a classroom to the world. Together with in-person visits and online programs, they connect with a billion people every year. That's in over 150 countries. That means much of the international audience that tuned in to the Rose Parade Monday could have been exposed to new learning opportunities in the new year. The float made with everything from golden bamboo to eucalyptus leaves, moss, and seaweed won the sweepstakes trophy for the most beautiful creation. The world's changing these days, so maybe what me reading a book in the past, it's a little different now, so we have tactile displays and all sorts of ways for kids to get integrated and involved in conservation. Every corner around the park and the zoo, uh, it's an adventure. And now, an award-winning adventure. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. If one of your New Year's resolutions is to see more movies in 2024, well, KPBS cinema junkie Beth Accomando has you covered. Here are reviews of hers for some non-mainstream films to start the new year. In All of Us Strangers, Andrew Scott plays Adam, a writer and a solitary soul. Then one night... Hello. Hi. Harry shows up. And the two men fall into a relationship, in part because they mirror each other's pain and loneliness. Does your mom and dad? Yeah. They died just before I was 12. I'm trying to write about them at the moment. How's it going? 
Strangely. Very strangely, as Adam returns to his family home and sees his parents as they were before they died. All of Us Strangers is a film about memory and about trying to go back to re-examine the past and redefine key relationships. The film maintains a mysterious tone, so we question what might be real or imagined. All of Us Strangers is a melancholy, bittersweet, and beautiful film about grief, loss, and trying to connect with others. The Thelonious Monk Ellison is an author, and he's upset. If they want stereotypes, I'll give them one. What is this? There'd be dads, rappers, crack, and black, right? Nobody's gonna publish this. I just wanna rub their noses in it. We love it. What? American fiction juggles an angry satire on the literary establishment with a family drama. It succeeds impressively with the latter, but comes up short on the satire. The film goes for predictable, low-hanging fruit rather than insightful and savage satire. There's some sharp writing, and Jeffrey Wright, as always, is flawless. The film does enough well to make me frustrated that the end result was not better. From the moment I saw Leningrad Cowboys Go America, I fell in love with Finnish filmmaker Aki Karismaki. His style is determinedly deadpan in a way that may turn some people off. But if you're willing to step into his world on his terms, you'll discover an endearing weirdness and a gallery of delightful characters, as well as a sharp, insightful eye critiquing the modern world. Fallen Leaves is Kuris Mackey's loopy take on rom-coms as a pair of Helsinki residents cross paths. But fate, or perhaps sitcom cruelty, keeps throwing obstacles in their way. Fallen Leaves is unique in every sense, and I hope I can convince some viewers to kick off 2024 by trying something new. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. We hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Tribulsi. Thanks for joining us.